Hi everyone, it's Tom from the team at Cascade here. And today we're gonna to be talking about how to implement the balance scorecard. And we're gonna do things a little bit differently from some of the other articles and videos you may have seen online about the balance scorecard. Because the truth is that the vast majority of the balance scorecard implementations that you've likely seen at other organizations, maybe places you worked at, were actually either completely wrong or perhaps they just didn't go far enough in terms of actually making use of this really powerful strategic framework. So the balance scorecard, you probably know roughly what it is. It's one of the best known strategy frameworks out there. Um, and it dates back to the 1980s. So some people have even kind of called it a little bit old school. It actually isn't old school. It's really, really simple. It's really, really effective. And it remains just as valuable a strategy framework today as when it was first implemented. Now, this particular video, this particular article is part of a series of different articles that we've created for probably five of the best strategy frameworks out there. So you can see on the screen right now, we've got links to the other ones that are also available uh, in this article. Uh, today, though, we're going to be talking about the balance scorecard. So let's quickly say what it is. So in very simple terms, the balance scorecard is four perspectives. It's four different essentially quadrants that you can categorize goals into across your organization to create a framework for your strategic plan. And those four quadrants, they've changed a little bit over the years. Um, we're gonna call them perspectives for, for this, uh, this guide. They are as follows. So the first one is financial. So this is everything to do with cash flow, revenue, sales performance, etc. The second one is customer. This is to do with customer experience, uh, the amount of on-time deliveries you, you do for customers, your net promoter score, share of customer spend, all that kind of stuff. Um, we've then got a perspective called internal business processes. So this is everything that you do internally within your organization that is not outward facing. And then the last perspective there is learning and growth. This is really all about people, and this is about activities that relate to improving your people and helping them get better at their jobs. So very, very simple perspectives. Um, implementing though is a little bit uh, a little bit more interesting than just looking at the perspectives. So before we look at that, let's just check out some of the benefits of the balance scorecard. Now, I'm not gonna read everything on screen here. You can obviously kind of check that out yourself, but I'm just gonna jump ahead to what I think are kind of the, the main benefits. For me, the big benefit of implementing the balance scorecard, yes, it gives you a nice way of making sure that you're ticking all of the boxes from a strategy perspective. So it helps ensure that you've got activities that are gonna help your customers, you've got activities that are gonna help your people, your financials and your processes. That's a really good starting point. And even the kind of like poor implementations of the balance scorecard will deliver some kind of, of focus uh, in those areas. But the real benefit is actually around working through a process to make sure that you deliver your ultimate aims, which is those financial outcomes. And we're gonna talk about that in a while. So focus is part of it, but having an actual process that you can follow in a series of linear steps is actually where the balance scorecard really, really comes into its own. And I'm gonna kind of explain that uh, now. So people talk about some challenges with the balance scorecard. They say it takes a lot of time to set up. They say that people don't really understand it. It's too rigid, it's too internally focused. All of these kind of criticisms are, are fair, but the majority of them are actually going to be addressed by implementing the balance scorecard in the way that I'm going to explain in a moment. Now let's kind of look at how people sort of implement the balance scorecard usually. So the first diagram that I've got on screen here is basically the same kind of diagram that you'll get if you Google the balance scorecard. If you, in fact, I'm actually going to do it right now. If you do a quick Google image search for balance scorecard, you'll actually see that the vast majority of the infographics and the diagrams that actually come up, they look pretty similar to the one on the screen there. So you can see here, we've got kind of this one here, we've got this one on the right here with all these kind of different quadrants. We've actually got our one has popped in there. You can see that they, they look pretty similar. But I'm actually gonna tell you that this diagram really isn't very helpful. Um, yes, it has the four quadrants. It looked kind of pretty, I suppose but it doesn't really tell you anything more than the list that we looked at above. Um, and that's because people, when they look at the balance scorecard, they think of it as a categorization process. So they think that all they need to do to create an effective strategy using the balance scorecard is basically go and make all of the goals that they're gonna do anyway, all of the objectives, all the projects, all the KPIs, 
and then categorize them into one of these four perspectives and then basically say, oh, we don't have enough in our learning and growth perspective. Let's add a few more goals. Let's make sure that we've got an even balance. And sometimes I think that the, the name balance scorecard actually contributes to, to some of this confusion. Implementing balance scorecard isn't really about balancing things between the four perspectives, although that is a potential side benefit. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to show you the, the right way to implement the balance scorecard. And that is using this diagram here, which is a little bit more complicated, but far more useful. So you can see that we've got the same four quadrants, financial, customer, process, and learning and growth. Um, but now we've actually got them in some kind of order. And if you follow the arrows, you can see that this diagram actually starts at the bottom. So the first entry point is into the learning and growth perspective. And what that's basically telling you is that in order to get to the top of this diagram, which is financial gains, you actually need to work through each layer in order. So it's not about just working on the four perspectives equally at the same time. Instead, it's about making sure that you're actually nailing each of the perspectives because each perspective unlocks the one above it. Now, if you think about it a different way, you could almost argue that you've got a series of kind of leading and lagging perspectives here. And what we mean by that is that a leading perspective is something that enables you to achieve a result. And that would be learning and growth, internal process and customer. These are enablers in your organization, essentially. Um, and then the financial perspective is probably your strongest lagging perspective. And by lagging, what we mean is that it's an output. It's an outcome. It's the things that the other three allow you to do. So what we're actually trying to do, the theory of the balance scorecard is ultimately all organizations are trying to drive their financial gain. But in order to do that, we need to actually work through these perspectives in order. So you can see here, the theory would go something like this. If you invest in improving the skills of your people, if you invest in better training and tools for your people, that is going to help them be better at their jobs. And the vast majority of their jobs involve some kind of internal process. Even if it's an externally facing outcome, such as marketing, most of that marketing will actually start off with an internal process. So your people will become more efficient and they'll output faster. Now, once they output faster, that means that your customers are going to get a better experience. So whether they're going to get a better experience, if you're a, if you're a physical goods company, it might be lower delivery time, or it might be higher speed to market with you know, outputting physical products, or even for us as a software company, we're outputting better products, better features sooner for our customers. We're responding to their queries on the live chat faster. All of that is driving a better customer experience. And that in turn is driving better customer retention and also other things like referrals, uh, goodwill, all those kind of things, potentially even bigger share of wallet. If we follow that up, you can see that that also leads to an increase of revenue, which ultimately ends at this top middle point of an increase of profit. Now, there is another way you can get there as well. If we go back to process efficiency, sometimes process efficiency actually has nothing to do with customers, and it's just about lowering costs. It's just about being more internally efficient. So you can see here, we've actually got an arrow that goes right up to the lower cost uh, section of the, the financial goals. And then ultimately that leads to an increase of profit as well. So you can see here that looking at the balance scorecard in this way, it's actually far more useful because what it does is it tells you, you need to invest in these things in this order to get to your ultimate goal of an increase of profit. So rather than looking at your strategy as a simple kind of set of quadrants and goals sitting amongst the four, instead, what you need to be do doing is categorizing your strategy into this kind of it's almost like a pyramid where you start at the bottom and you work up to this ultimate goal of increased profit. It's a little bit more complicated, but it actually makes the balance scorecard really effective and really interesting. And people can actually understand now why is it important to do learning and growth? Why is it important to do better internal processes? Because ultimately, this is how you're going to increase your profit. Whereas when we look at it in the old way, people can easily look at that and go, yeah, well, you know, my job really is nothing to do with these three. All I worry about is the bottom line. I just got to drive revenue. Yeah, that's not actually very helpful, though, because it doesn't actually change anything. Just being accountable for a revenue target is not the same as actually implementing projects and objectives 
that are going to drive that revenue to a new place, launching new products, et cetera, et cetera. So when you think about your strategy, think about it in this sense and categorize your goals, yes, into the quadrants, but more specifically, make sure that you've got a really good foundation in the learning and growth, internal process and customer perspectives, because these are the ones that are going to help you ultimately lower cost, increase revenue and therefore increase profit. So a really different way of looking at it from the simplistic approach we started with. Now, I will say that one of the, the criticisms of the balance scorecard is that sometimes people say that perhaps it's not that well suited for organizations that want to do things other than increase profit. So that could be government organizations, it could be um, even companies like Google um, and arguably Facebook who kind of claim that they have objectives around uh, world betterment and sort of societal gains, you know, technological advancements that, that go beyond uh, pure profit. Now, that is true. And I think there are elements of the balance scorecard that are, are going to be perhaps less appropriate to, to some organizations. However, the principle of structuring your goals in this way still makes sense. So you could actually remove the increase of profit from the top of this pinnacle and you could make it something else. And then you may have to tweak some of the drivers as you get there. But the whole approach and the whole kind of four perspectives approach is still going to be pretty similar for the vast majority of organizations. Now, we've kind of covered how this actually works and we've covered sort of like, you know, what the difference is between the traditional approach or rather the, the simplistic approach to implementing the balance scorecard and the approach that I've outlined above. Um, some of the benefits of that, first of all, it helps you create a really tangible roadmap to get from where you are today <clears throat> to where you want to be tomorrow. Um, rather than just being a simple set of categorization, it's a, it's a path, it's a roadmap. Um, it also really helps you kind of identify where you've got major roadblocks on that path to driving better financial performance. It helps you articulate exactly what your goals are doing to drive towards the ultimate revenue uh, objective or, or cost reduction objective. And it helps you to prioritize your business activities in the order that they need to be tackled. So there's really no point trying to launch fantastic products if you don't have good people. It's simply not going to work. So by putting it in those layers, it actually helps you figure out what you need to do first. So a ton of benefit. It also just makes the balance scorecard relevant and interesting, something that people can talk about rather than just being this simple categorization kind of exercise. Now, when it comes to actually putting some meat on the bones and implementing the balance scorecard for the business, um, there's a couple of things that you really need to think about. That there's, there's kind of two main phases to the strategy lifecycle that you're going to want to put the balance scorecard into. The first is the strategic planning side of things, and we're going to cover that in a moment. And then the second is actually in the strategy tracking side of things. So you're going to want to implement balance scorecard processes in both your strategy planning and your strategy tracking. Now let's have a look at that first and actually see uh, what that looks like. So when it comes to implementing the balance scorecard in strategic planning, there are two ways that you can actually do this. Um, method one is, I would say, the simpler approach. And this is using something that we call focus areas. So this basically requires you to set up a series of focus areas for your business. And those focus areas are actually going to align to the perspectives of the balance scorecard. So you can see here, I've got a customer focus area, finance, learning and growth and process. Just make your focus areas, your um, perspectives, and then put all of your goals into those focus areas. That is what we've kind of called method one in the article. Now, method two is better suited to organizations who are perhaps a little more mature around strategic planning, and that is using something that we call goal types. And what this basically allows you to do is it allows you to add the balance scorecard to your existing kind of like strategy configuration. So let me show you what I mean by that. So instead of using focus areas as equivalents to the um, uh, actual balance scorecard perspectives, what you're gonna be able to do with this approach is you're gonna be able to have your own set of different focus areas. So you can see here now on my focus areas, I've got ones around growth, manufacturing, a couple around manufacturing and around being a top place to work. Now that's cool. But you may ask, OK, well, where then is the balance scorecard in this model? So what we've done here is we've used something called 
uh, custom fields essentially, depending on which kind of strategy software you're using or, or how you're doing it, you may do it a little differently. Um, but you can see here that I've actually got a field against all of my activities, all of my projects, KPIs, etc., that is then basically allowing me to categorize my goals into the balance scorecard um, using these custom fields and these colors. And what this allows you to do is basically mix and match between having your own set of distinct focus areas and still getting the benefit of the balance scorecard methodology. It's a little bit more sophisticated because you've actually got two elements you need to manage from a strategic plan perspective, but it does give you a little bit more flexibility. So depending on how mature you are as an organization, you may choose option one, which is a simple perspective focus area approach, or you might go with option two, which allows you to have separate focus areas combined with some goal types. Now, from a planning perspective, really everything from this point works just the same as creating any other strategic plan. And we've created loads of articles about that. So you can check out all of the links in the article for how to actually write those objectives, those projects, those KPIs. But from a structure perspective, this is going to give you a strategic plan that you're going to be able to report on with the balance scorecard really, really easily. So let's move on now to the second part of implementing the balance scorecard, and that is around strategy tracking. So it's all very well having a strategic plan that uses the balance scorecard, but you need to actually infuse the balance scorecard into your strategy rhythm, into your monthly team meetings, into your board updates, whatever that looks like. So I'm going to show you a couple of ways that you're going to want to do that. So the first thing you're going to want to do Again, this is regardless of what strategy execution uh, solution you're using, whether you're using Cascade, whether you're using a, a different provider, or even just Excel, you're going to want to create some kind of balance scorecard dashboard. This is going to be basically the home of the balance scorecard for high level kind of stakeholders, people like board members, people like, um, you know, maybe team meetings at a, at a senior executive level. And on that dashboard, you're going to want to do a few things. So I've actually got one set up in Cascade that I'm going to show you now. And I'm just going to kind of walk you through how to set up that dashboard. So pretty simple. You're going to want to set up the dashboard, obviously, with the four perspectives. Now, I always put finance in the top left of my dashboards because ultimately this is probably the one that people are going to be the most interested in. This is probably going to be the one that people are, are going to kind of look at first. And then they're going to look at the other four perspectives to say, OK, well, what are we doing to make the, those financial results even better? So we've got finance, we've got customer. If I scroll down a bit, we've got learning and growth and we've also got internal process. Now, what I've got within each of these uh, dashboard widgets is I've basically got on the surface a fairly straightforward list of the key activities that we're doing across the organization. And they're actually grouped by whether they're objectives, whether they're KPIs, whether they're projects. So you can see here, I've got all of my finance KPIs. Underneath that, I've got all of my finance objectives. And I've got the same kind of structure in each of my quadrants. And I've got like an, an at a glance view of how completed we are against all of those different activities and how well those different KPIs are doing. This nice little Gantt chart view is also kind of showing me where we're up to, which ones are completed, which ones are going to be coming up next in the next quarter, etc. Um, really crucially, we've also got this metric in the top right of each of these widgets, which is basically giving essentially a score for how well that particular perspective of the balance scorecard is tracking. So we've got 70% completion across all of our KPIs and objectives in the financial space, quite a bit lower in our customer learning and growth and internal processes. And in fact, if I kind of look at the internal processes here at 54%, you can actually see a lot of our activities here are showing up in orange, uh, and that's because a lot of them are actually starting to fall behind. So at a glance, you might want to say, well, OK, internal process, this is something we need to actually attack. So this is a really simple, really effective way of just demonstrating your commitment to the balance scorecard by creating a nice, clean uh, balance scorecard dashboard. Now, there's also another way of reporting against the balance scorecard, and I, I wouldn't do this instead of a dashboard, I would actually do this alongside a dashboard. And this basically involves creating slightly more detailed balance scorecard reports. So in our tool, we're going to use something called the uh, snapshot builder. So I'm just going to go into snapshots and I'm going to quickly create a balance scorecard report. So I'm just going to choose which strategic plan I want to look at. And then I'm going to make sure that on this particular report, I've actually got the balance scorecard um, attribute being displayed. 
So it's gonna kind of show here. And I'm just gonna move it over to be this column on the left-hand side. I'm gonna make my update column a little bit bigger there. And I'm just gonna go and generate a report here just to kind of give you a sense of how this is gonna work. Now, obviously the way that you implement this is gonna vary depending on what reporting methodology you're using. This is basically something called a strategy snapshot. It's just showing you again that same list of, of activities, except now we're actually showing a lot more information. So we're showing the updates that people are putting in there. We're showing any tasks that people have put in. And then we're also showing a little bit more detail about the different metrics uh, of those balanced scorecard elements. So you can see here, we've actually got a profit margin goal and it's showing me exactly where my profit margin is ahead or behind uh, against that goal. So introducing some kind of standard templatized team meeting report that brings in these balanced scorecard perspectives is gonna be a really good way of bringing this to life across your organization as well. Now, when it comes to kind of wrapping this all together, obviously you can implement as many tools as you like. Ultimately, what you need to do is you need to demonstrate that the balanced scorecard is important to you and you need to communicate to your people why it's important. So it's not just about actually creating the reports, it's also about communicating effectively this diagram up here, because this is the thing that I think is gonna motivate people to actually get behind the implementation of the balanced scorecard. Now, obviously this guide is just the beginning. Um, if you do want a little bit more help actually setting up the balance scorecard, if you are using something like Cascade or you just wanna give it a try for the first time, let us know. We can actually configure an environment uh, in our strategy tool, um, which is perfect for the balance scorecard. It works really, really well. We've got lots of really big organizations using Cascade to implement the balance scorecard. Also happy to answer any questions about balance scorecard implementations. Just leave a comment on the article or hit us up on social media, or of course, send us an email. Hopefully that's been a useful and slightly different way of looking at the balance scorecard and look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks guys, bye-bye.